be seated. There was a story a few years ago that a physicist uh, was talking to a friend of his and said, you know, I've been observing a bumblebee and I don't think that it's possible for the bumblebee to fly. I've done the calculations, the wings are just too small for the mass of the body, and the numbers just don't work out as I crunch them. It just doesn't seem possible that this bumblebee should be able to fly. Well, some entomologists and some other physicists said, well, we look outside and we see a bumblebee flying, so apparently it can fly. How is it able to fly? And so they began doing a little research and they found out that the original calculations from the first physicist was based on the aerodynamics of an airplane. You know, an airplane just has the fixed wings that sit out there and if you look that the, the body is long and skinny in relationship to the wings and so that creates the, the lift that allows that plane to get up in the air. And so they said, okay, well, that's probably where some of the calculations were off, but maybe he, we should look at a bird. And I said, well, no, you know, the, the ratio of the wing size and the muscle mass to the body size of the bird is what makes them fly, and, and the, the uh, bumblebee doesn't have that. But then as technology began to get better and we could slow it down and look at the wings flapping, they said, oh, well, here's part of the problem. When birds fly, their wings flap up and down like this, and bumblebees, their wings move more back and forth like this. So that's where our calculations were off, and they started doing the math again, and then they said, well, no, wait a minute, that still doesn't quite add up. And as technology got a little bit better and we could slow things down and look a little bit more closely, they said, oh, well, the bumblebee is not up and down, and it's not back and forth. It's kind of a combination between the two. <laughs> It looks like a helicopter that the propeller's not quite working right. So, and he's got one on each side. So how exactly can he go? And so they created a term that's called dynamic stall. They're trying to figure out, and they said, well, when this bumblebee, with this unusual motion of his wings, he's actually creating these tiny little hurricanes these little wind vortexes underneath his wings and his body that's allowing him to propel through the air. But they're still stumped on exactly how does he make the turns and stop and start. How can you harness the wind and control the wind? And in the meantime, the bumblebee just happily flies around from flower to flower, not really caring what the laws of physics or aerodynamics or dynamic stall happen to say. And, you know, the bumblebee really proves a point for us and that is that experience trumps <laughs> argument every time. The person that has an argument that says, well, you can't do that, is always trumped by the person who's actually doing that. <laughs> the argument for something is always trumped by somebody who's actually doing the thing. And so the bumblebee just is happily flying around saying, you know, you guys can crunch the numbers all you want and create new terms and try to figure out what I'm doing and I'm just gonna do it. We've been in this series in 1 Peter where Peter refers to Christians multiple times as aliens and strangers. That's his word for us. And what he's really saying is that we live in this, uh, on earth, but as people who have invited Jesus into our life and say that Jesus is now our Lord and our master, our citizenship is not here on earth. This is not where we're gonna end. Um, our physical life may end here, but then we spend eternity in heaven. So we've really become citizens of heaven. We're just passing through here. We're aliens and strangers as we pass through this earth. And as a result, there's some ways that we behave that just kind of like the bumblebee, the, the physicist and the entomologist and sitting there looking going, how does he do that? There's some people that look at Christians and go, what are they doing? How did, and that's the reason why Peter says, Good title for us is Aliens and Strangers. We're unusual in the way that we behave when we're here. In fact, Peter went so far as to say one of the things that makes uh, the, that is going to attract people's attention is the, this hope that we have that this is not all that there is is here in this earth. And so we looked at this verse, uh, actually a couple of verses, uh, 
two weeks ago, Peter just finished saying, uh, telling us to not be afraid of what makes everybody else afraid. We're not frightened by the things that, are, that frighten them. But instead, in 1 Peter chapter 3, he says, but. So in, in contrast to the people that are fearful and running around and wringing their hands, trying to figure things out, trying to figure out how the bumblebee flies and the bumblebee is just flying, he says people are going to be wringing their hands trying to figure out how can you be like this and you're just being like that. He says, but you, in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. He's saying the way that we live is going to cause people to be curious and they're going to want to ask us, how can you have this kind of hope? Now, the kind of hope that, that Peter's talking about here is not kind of like, cross my fingers, not really sure if this is going to work out. This word hope is this confident expectation, this rock solid belief that I have that it is going to come about. I may not see it with my physical eyes right now. I may not be able to explain it to you in a mathematical formula, much like the physicists cannot explain in the mathematical formula how does this bee control these vortexes and this dynamic stall and moving around but the bee just does it well it's the same thing with us as followers of jesus christ people are going to go can you write that down how, how do you what's the formula and you say i have this confident expectation i have this rock solid hope that what i believe is true this god that I've placed my hope in. And he said, people are going to begin to ask you this question. Tell me the reason for the hope that you have. Now, my experience has been that most of the time when people are going to notice that is when it stands out in stark contrast to what everybody else is feeling. When all the earthlings are saying, well, this is how we should be behaving right now. This is what you should be feeling. And you're feeling something completely different. So I like how the psalmist says it, Psalm 25, 3. He says this, no one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. We're never going to be embarrassed like, oh, man, I said that that was what I believed and now it's not happening. If we place our hope in him, we're never going to be put to shame. Then Paul in Romans echoes the same thought. He says, and, and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. We're, we're never going to be put to shame. Peter, earlier on in his book, in his letter here to, to us aliens and strangers, he talks about even when we're facing the uncertainty that some people have of death. He said, but in this, in chapter 1, verse 3, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have this resurrection hope because of what Jesus did. And then just a few verses later, verse number 13, he says, Now therefore, so in light of this, prepare your minds for action, be self-controlled, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. We have this hope in all of these uncertain times that Jesus is going to be true to his word. Now, this phrase that's in here where Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer, there, that's actually just one Greek word, apologia, from where we get our word apologetic. Now, that doesn't mean I'm sorry that I believe this. It's not that. Apologetics is giving a reasoned defense, a reasoned explanation for why we believe what we believe. Now let me sum up, and I shared this with you two weeks ago, but here's the statement that we're going to really key in on. This is what it comes right down to. If people are gonna ask us the reason for the hope that we have, we're gonna say this. My hope is based on the resurrection from the dead of Jesus Christ, which I believe because the Bible tells me so, and because my life has been changed. Okay, I, so, Always be prepared to give an answer for the reason for the hope that you have. Okay, here's my hope. My hope is based on the resurrection of the dead, from the dead of Jesus Christ, because of the Bible told me so, and because my life is different by inviting Jesus into it.
Okay? Mm -hmm. So I want to walk you through three different apologetics that we're going to uh, look at. And I'm going to share with you um, some evidence that will help you. Now, let me, let me state this. We've talked about this before. There is different kinds of faith that people can have. We see it all the time. There's one that's called blind faith, where somebody says, I believe it, even though there's zero proof. There's no evidence, but I'm going to place my faith in that. Can't tell you why. I have no reasons for it. I just am going to choose to believe. That's blind faith. There's another kind of faith that's called unreasonable faith. And that's when somebody says, I choose to continue to believe this, even though all of the other evidence seems to be pointing a different direction. I'm still just going to say, nope, I'm clinging to this. Regardless of what anybody tells me, regardless of what they show me, it becomes unreasonable faith. But then there's also reasonable faith. Now, that doesn't mean that it's irrefutable, that, that, that uh, you know, there's not any questions or any doubts, but it's saying there's enough evidence here that it's reasonable to believe what I believe. It's reasonable for me to put my faith in this because of where everything is pointing. So think of like in a court of law, right? What's one of the things that the judge will tell the jury? He'll say, if you have a reasonable doubt, if the reasons are sending you more towards doubt than they are towards belief, then you need to acquit the person. You need to say, well, I've heard this evidence and I've weighed it. And that's the same thing as apologists, as Christian apologists, that we want to be able to say, okay, I've weighed the evidence and it's reasonable for me to place my faith here because of where the evidence points me. So the first thing that, that we're saying um, that where I want to start is I want us to look at the authenticity of this book, the Bible. And I love this statement. It's short as succinct, but it captures it perfectly. Eric Metaxas pointed this out. The Bible is the best attested book of antiquity. Mm -hmm. The Bible is the best attested book of antiquity. By that, what he means is there have been not one archaeological discovery that has ever refuted something that has been reported in the Bible. In fact, it's just the opposite. Mm -hmm. All the archaeological dis discoveries, all of the other manuscripts of historical events that are taking place at the same time will attest to what's going on in the Bible. So the Bible has this authenticity behind it. This, you know, we, we can say we trust the words that are there because of the evidence that's backing that up. Now, the Bible, as you know, is divided up into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, that's not the names that the writers gave them. That's um, much after the fact, as we kind of put together all 66 books, that we gave them these different names. Um, sometimes, just to, to help us out, I like to refer to it as the First Testament and the Second Testament. Because sometimes when you hear old and new, you think outdated and up-to-date. And that's not really the case. The Old Testament is everything that took place before Jesus came to earth in human form. And then the New Testament is Jesus fulfilling everything that was in the Old Testament. So the Old Testament and the New Testament fit together. You, you have to have both of them. Now, the 39 books that we call the Old Testament, the, the Jewish people already had those books established and a, what we, the word we use, a canon of scripture, that means this complete collection, they already had that established a couple hundred years before Jesus even came to earth. So before, let's say, 0 AD, okay, the, the, the Jews already said, here's these 39 books that we've already attested to, that we know the, the, that they have been well documented, that as Eric Metaxas said, that they, they've been well attested. Now let me read for you what Josh McDowell said about the Old Testament uh, in his book called God Breathed. He said, no other work in all literature has been so carefully and accurately copied as the Old Testament. The particular discipline and art of the Jewish scribes came out of a class of Jewish scholars between the 5th and 3rd centuries BC. They were called the Sophirim, from a Hebrew word meaning scribes. The Sophirim who initiated a stringent standard of meticulous discipline were subsequently eclipsed by the Talmudic scribes, okay, these guys became even more meticulous, 
who guarded, interpreted, and commented on the sacred texts from AD 100 to 500. And then in turn, the Talmudic scribes were followed by the better known and even more meticulous Masoretic scribes beginning at AD 500 and going through 900. These scribes took their work very seriously and very scientifically. They would write out each letter and their letters have to fit between the lines. Remember when you had to learn that in school? When your teacher was drilling that, you know, your, your letter has to stop here and start here. This is where the loops go. And, okay, That's how they did that, meticulously across. But they counted not only every word, but every letter. And so it was really easy in the, the scribal process. Now, you know, there was no photocopiers, there's no printing press, okay? So it's everything's just, you're looking at a text and you're copying it down. But they had it so measured out that they knew what the middle word and middle letter was on every page. And so it was really easy for somebody, another set of eyes to look over somebody's shoulder and say, nope, this one's wrong, start over. <laughs> it's, not, it's not right. And, and the person, the scribe who wrote it down was not the one who could verify the authenticity of his work. There had to be multiple sets of other eyes that people would come and they would count lines and count letters and look for center words and they knew where verses stopped and started and so they could pinpoint those. And once it was had been attested, then they said this is a certified copy. Now it can be given to somebody else. It can be distributed. It was very carefully copied down. Mm -hmm. Now, then we come to the New Testament. The New Testament, obviously we're a little bit closer in history, and so there are more historical documents that we can refer to and say what's going on in history at the same time as Bible history, we can read it somewhere else. And we can also read, we read people who are um, very anti-Christian, people who are even anti-Jewish. That, but they were historians, and they would write down historical accounts of what was happening in the area of Israel at that time, and they line up with what was recorded in biblical history as well. So the Archaeological Study Bible has an article in there about the New Testament texts and their accuracy, and listen, what you're, you're going to hear here is, sounds very similar to what we just read about, what Josh McDowell said about the Old Testament task, texts. He, the, the New Testament says that about this. No other ancient text is substantiated by such a wealth of ancient textual witnesses, so in other words, written material, as is the New Testament. Roughly 5,500 separate manuscripts are available, variously containing anything from the entire New Testament corpus to a slight fragment of a single verse. This textual support is far superior to that available for any other ancient documents, such as the classical texts from Greek and Roman writers like Plato, Aristotle, and Cicero. Only partial manuscripts have survived for many works of antiquity, and it is not unusual to find that the only complete manuscript for some ancient writing is a copy dating from a thousand years after its composition. In other words, some of these texts that we go to look up, we say, this is when it, the events took place, but the first copy of any written work we can find is a thousand years later. We can't find anything in between. But the, the New Testament writers, many of them were writing within 10, 15, 20 years of the events that were taking place. And when, then when we kind of get to the book of, of uh, Acts, where Luke, a first-rate historian, Modern day historians today still look back at what Luke wrote and said, this guy set the bar for historians. We can read in his writing where it was almost like we're reading his diary. He's traveling along with Paul and he's like, just as he's walking with Paul, he's like just, you know, writing things down. And then we went here and then, and then Paul said this and he's writing down what Paul's saying. And, and he's just, he's right there in almost real time capturing what the events that are, that are taking place. And then we have multiple, multiple manuscripts that we can go back to and look. Whereas many of these things that, that have been accepted as historical documents, as, as that article said, sometimes there's a thousand years. Sometimes we have hardly any manus other manuscripts to be able to refer to, to say, you know, is this accurate? Has been translated and transferred throughout the time accurately. At about a um, thousand AD is where we find the first copy of the Bible, all 66 books put together uh, in the order that we have them now. 
And um, you know, again, we have this, this great attestation to the Old Testament and the New Testament accuracy. But it was just this, this one collection, about 1000 AD, said there's our first Bible. And pretty much every Bible that we had after that always referred back to this one original one to make sure that it was accurate. In the late 1940s, there were some shepherds by the uh, Dead Sea that stumbled upon a cave. And inside the cave, they found some pottery jars. And when they opened those jars, they found inside some different scrolls and manuscripts that had been preserved in there. All total, as archaeologists began to search that area, they found 11 caves with tens of thousands of documents that had been saved in these jars. Some of them were just private correspondence. Some of them would amount to, um, like if you had written down a grocery list on the back of an envelope. That's, that's the kind of thing. Some of them were like um, IOUs. Um, and writing this down, I owe you this much money, so we're putting it in writing so that you can collect later. But we also found a bunch of passages of Scripture. Some very lengthy passages, some just short verses. In fact, um, we were able to find passages of Scripture from every book of the Bible except for the book of Esther. So we could, we could find 65 of the 66 books of the Bible. We found passages of Scripture that were recorded on those scrolls that, that uh, we refer to now as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so now, where before we were only referring back to a Bible that was at 1000 AD, some of these manuscript pieces that we found from the scripture went back to 250 BC. It went back another 1200 plus years farther back. And so Dr. Peter Flint, listen to what his conclusion was as he examined all the evidence from the Dead Sea Scrolls and compared it to the original, uh, the, the complete Bible that we had in 1000 AD and went backwards. He said this, the biblical Dead Sea Scrolls are up to 1,250 years older than the traditional Hebrew Bible, the Masoretic text. Remember those Masoretes were, they were the primo scribes. Okay? We, have a, we have been using a 1,000 year old manuscript to make our Bibles. Now we've got scrolls going back to 250 BC. So our conclusion is simply this, the scrolls confirm the accuracy of the biblical text by 99%. Going back again to what Eric Metaxas said, there is no other book in antiquity that has been as attested to with its accuracy as the Bible has. Well, going back to 900 BC or, or thereabouts, in Psalm 119, we read this, this psalmist is enthralled with God's word. Now, he's, we don't even have the, the, the full... Uh, text. We don't have the full 39 books of the Old Testament yet. But this psalmist writes this poem, 176 verses long. Every eight verses start with a new uh, letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And every all of these verses just begin to extol all of the, the value and the validity and the encouragement and the hope that comes from God's word. Remember, that's what our statement was, that, that our hope is based on the resurrection from the dead of Jesus Christ because of what the Bible says and our personal testimony. So I, want, I just pulled out just a few verses. You can hear what this uh, psalmist writes um, as far as the word and hope. Okay, so Psalm 119, verse 43. Do not snatch the word of truth from my mouth, for I have put my hope in your laws. Uh, verse number 74, may those who fear you rejoice when they see me, for I have put my hope in your word. Verse number 81, my soul faints with longing for your salvation, but I have put my hope in your word. Verse number 114, you are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. Uh, verse 147, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I have put my hope in your word. Long before we even said, you know, heard what Dr. Peter Flint said, long before Dr. Eric Metaxas said this is the best attested book, and we're saying our hope is based on this, the psalmist is writing, your word gives me hope, your word gives me hope, your word gives me hope. And nothing has changed for 2,900 years that God's word still gives us hope. When we get to the New Testament, Paul writes this in Romans chapter 15, verse number 4. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, 
we might have hope. Verse number 13, just a couple verses farther down, he says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. My hope is built on this. My hope stands on this. Is it reasonable for me to put my faith in the words in this book? I think it's highly reasonable. I think there's evidence that is reasonable to follow the evidence to say that this is a trustworthy book. Well, what about then the second apologetic we need to look at that we say our, our hope station statement is built on is really that Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, I don't want to spend, uh, we, we could go back and, and dig through a lot of the uh, accounts in the Gospels, but I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 because here's where Paul sort of sums up everything that's going on. Now, Paul is writing this, uh, this letter to, to the, the church at Corinth. He's writing this about 20 years after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension to heaven. So it's not that far down the road after those events took place. About 20 years. Also, notice this, he's writing this letter to the church at Corinth. Corinth is one of the most important cities in the Greco-Roman world. Now, when we say uh, writing a letter, um, I know some of you, you know, don't know anything about like writing a letter, putting an envelope, putting a stamp on it, and, you know, okay. But that's not even really what we're talking about. The letter was really an open document. Um, it was written, that's why it's not really addressed to a person, it's addressed to the church. Because it would, be, it would go on public display. So the letter would be sent, Paul would, would write this out, give it to one of his friends, his trusted friends, say, take this to the church in Corinth. That friend would take it to Corinth and say, here's a, a letter from Paul. And you know how our, uh, today our police department has a thing that they call the chain of custody of evidence, where there's like, you know, little stickers on things where you can tell nothing's been opened, the seal hasn't been broken, here's my initials that I passed it off to you. That's kind of what would happen, is that, say, Timothy, for instance, one of Paul's trusted advisors, he would take this letter from Paul, it would be sealed with wax so it couldn't be opened, and he would show up at the church, and they'd go, hey, Timothy, we know you. And he says, yep, and here's the letter that I have from Paul. You can see that it's sealed with the wax. I haven't opened it. Nobody else has opened it. And then Paul always, at the end of his letters, he, he transcribed, you know, he, he spoke it, somebody else wrote it down for him. But he always signed his name at the end. And so people could say, you know, well, yeah, there's, his, there's his signature. And then they would gather everybody together in the church and they would open up this manuscript and they would begin to read it out loud. After they were done reading it, other people said, oh, sorry, I was out of town, I couldn't hear it. They'd come by and they'd set up another time to read it. And then eventually this letter would just go on public display. Anybody in the city, whether they belong to the church or not, could come and read this letter. So I say all that to say, listen, what Paul writes, that anybody can scrutinize. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. You believe this, you've placed your hope in this. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Okay? I've given you reasonable evidence for you to place your faith in. So he goes on to say, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that's still, you know, okay, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared, now check out this list, to Peter and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and the last of all, he appeared to me. Now, you see what Paul is doing by naming names? And this letter is going to be on public display? That means there was still, he said 20 years later, yeah, some of, some of the people have died. Most of them are still alive. Most of the people that saw this with their own eyes and are attesting to what was said in Scripture before what was written down there, they can tell you it's true. They saw it for themselves. Okay? Now, over the years, there's been all these theories that the whole resurrection story is a made-up story. 
um, that uh, the disciples stole the body out of the, the tomb and pretended like he was alive. Um, or that Jesus never actually really died, but, you know, came back to life later on and lived a happy life, married somewhere else, you know, moved to India or, or whatever. Or, or that people, this, well, 500 people saw it. It must have been a mass hallucination. They were hypnotized into seeing that. I mean, okay, so again, let's talk about reasonable faith and unreasonable faith. Which one of those accounts sound, even though you say, well, this is fantastic. Somebody died, and three days later they came back to life. Even though that sounds fantastic, the evidence that is given for this fantastic sounding story versus the evidence given for all these conspiracies that would have to take place in order for that to, to go forward. Which one sounds like it's reasonable to believe? And Paul says here, there, there's people that you could go and question. I like a couple of verses later on, he even uh, verse number 19, he said, for if, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. If all we believe is that, you know, Jesus was a good teacher, but then once he died, it was over, then we have no hope. Then when we die, it's all over too. And what a miserable way to live. <laughs> but here's the thing that probably gets me the most as far as uh, the implausibility of believing that they made the story up. First of all, it's very difficult for a group of people to keep a uh, conspiracy going. I mean, it's been said that the best conspiracy is just between two people and then one needs to kill the other one. And then you can keep it. The more people you get involved in a conspiracy, the harder it is for everybody to keep their story straight. Right? It's a, it becomes a lot easier to pick holes in. Let alone when some of these Christians start getting tortured to death and people are saying, renounce your faith. Just admit that it's all made up. And they go through horrific torture and say, no, this is true, this is true, this is true. By the end of the first century, historians say that there was something like 20,000 Christians on the face of the earth. By the end of the third century, there was like 20 million Christians. That means that the growth of Christians had to quadruple for five consecutive generations. That just doesn't happen because of a lie, because of a conspiracy, because of a made-up story. And that really then leads me into our third apologetic, is that I know that it's true because I know my life is different with Jesus in it. Uh, you can even be very pragmatic about it and say, you know, uh, let me use the example of uh, tithing. The Bible says that I should give 10% of my income to God. Now, mathematically, that doesn't sound like a way to get ahead. <laughs> right? I mean, honestly... Just, I'm making the claim that I can do better on 90% of my income than I can on 100%. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense. But here's what I know from personal experience. When I give God the tithe first, my 90% does go as far as I need it to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I know. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't write that formula down for you and have it make sense that 90 is greater than 100. Right? that the bumblebee can't fly, or if he does, it's got all of these vortexes and, and stall dynamics and all that. I, I can't figure that out, but I know that it's true. Mm -hmm. But I know that it's true based on what? Well, not only my personal experience, but also going back to saying, well, these words, this is the best attested book, and I follow the words that are in here, and well, when I follow these words, it actually works. Mm -hmm. And part of the words in here that tell me, they tell me that when I place my faith in Jesus, that though I might die here on this earth, that my next breath is in his presence and I live with him forever and forever and forever. And so my hope is based on the fact that Jesus Christ did die 
and he was raised back to life. And I know that that's true because the best attested book of history tells me that that took place. And I know the difference in my life. I know what my life was like before Jesus. And I know what my life has been like after Jesus has come into my heart. And that's why we say that the person with the experience is never at the mercy of the person with an argument. Friends, I, I, I spent the last part of my, my college career at Wayne State University, which uh, I was uh, told later by some other people, probably uh, one of the most liberal, um, atheistic, humanistic uh, campuses that is, exists in our, uh, in our nation. And I was uh, in the science department. All of my professors that have all these initials after their name, they were all atheists, they were all evolutionists. Not one of them believed that this world that we live in was created, it just it happened to come about. They believed that all of the life that we have all just evolved and that there was no God. And every once in a while they would throw something out, they would say, you know, it's uh, one professor It started with me, he said it's an evolutionarily accepted fact. And I raised my hand and I said, I, I thought that the theory of evolution was still a theory, not an accepted fact. And he said, well, sure, there are some fundamentalist Christians that would blindly hold to something. I said, well, that'd be me except for the blind part. <laughs> All I had to do was do that in one class. I had zero allies. <laughs> not one of my classmates uh, was on my side and all of my pro professors got the memo that there was a creationist in their classes. And you know what infuriated them? Is that they would target some of their lectures at me and they would quote people and they would list all these scientific resources and I would just sit there and smile and say, but I know my life is different because Jesus is in it. Amen. And it infuriated them. Now. When Peter says to be prepared to give an answer, some people aren't going to come along and say, uh, I'd really like to know. Some people are going to come along and go, how in the world can you believe this? You're a moron. You're an idiot. You got your head stuck in the sand, and they're just going to rip into you. Okay? So that's why it's very important that we don't separate that first part of the verse from the second part. Peter says, when you give your answer, be gentle. Be respectful and speak to them in a way that you would have a clear conscience he said if you do it that way at some point they're going to be ashamed about the nasty things that they've said about you so we, we've got nothing to fear okay so people can come to you with all their arguments that they want and you can be just like the bumblebee the bumblebee doesn't care about all of these different theories that people are floating around and all the math that they're doing, the bumblebee just is happily flying from flower to flower. I think that he's, since he's doing what God created him to do, he's joyful. He's happy. He's, he's doing what God created him to do. And that can be us. Just go grocery shopping, go to work, go to the ball game, just go about your life as happy as a person that, that has accepted Jesus into their life and knows that, that your salvation is secure and you just, you know, just buzz along in your life <laughs> and let people go, no, that doesn't make any sense. There's no, that we've got all the arguments why that shouldn't be. And just gently, respectfully with a clear conscience say, here's what my hope is based on. Jesus died. He rose back to life and I know it because the Bible tells me so, and because I know my life is different Amen. with Jesus in it. Amen. That's it. Amen. You don't have to pick a fight. You don't have to... They want to get into the nitty-gritty about something, and that's, that's fine. You know, I mean, you can say that's... For sure, we'll talk about that. But that's... Bottom line, that's what it comes down to. I have this hope that Jesus is alive, and I know it because of the difference inside of me, and I know it because of what the Bible said. Now... The application questions that, uh, that we're going to hand out to you this week, one of them says, 
uh, really words to this effect. Is there is there an area that I feel like I need to know a little bit more? Like maybe somebody's come to me and challenged something and said, well, how can you believe this because of this? And you go, hmm, that's kind of a tough one for me. Okay, so th that's, that is something for us to consider because, you know, Peter does say to be prepared to give an answer. So if there's a time that comes along, and so listen, hey, there, there's nothing wrong with if somebody comes to you that your initial response is, I don't know, that's a good question. Let me do a little research on it. Let, let, me, let me see what I can find to, to talk to you about that. Okay, now, you're going to have to gauge their, their tone of voice, you know, if they're like, okay, I don't understand this versus you're an idiot. No, you don't have to have arguments with those kind of people. Okay? You don't, don't trade them the, the barbs back and forth. I've tried. It doesn't work. Okay? They're, they're not really in a mood to have a conversation. They just want to make their points. Okay? But if they're really legitimately questioning and they're open to that and you say, I don't really know, that's, that's okay. Answer to fine. Um, I'd be happy to help you do some exploration to, to find something, to be able to, to talk to them. But I want you to think that through. That's, that's one of the questions this week is, is there an area is there that somebody has asked me something? Or maybe I've even had the question before. You know, I've read, some, I've read this in the Bible, and I don't know if somebody questioned me about that, if I'd be able to answer that part or, you know, something else. Um, th those are good things to keep exploring. We don't want to... We want to keep our minds active. We want to keep developing. We want to keep learning so that we can, as Peter said, give an answer to everyone who asks us for the reason for the hope we have. But don't feel like you have to really even initially go past anything else besides my hope is based on this. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. I know it because the Bible told me so, and I know it because my heart, my life is different because of that. That's the hope that we can stand on. Let's pray this morning. I want to just pray this morning um, before I, I pray for my friends who are aliens and strangers. I want to pray for you that uh, you would be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you. But I, I want to pray first of all for um, anyone that you may be here in this room or you may be watching the broadcast, maybe watching this on video later. And you say, you know, I was a bit skeptical before I saw this. But now that I have heard this evidence, there's something inside my heart that is telling me that I can believe this, that I can place my faith in Jesus. And friends, that's, that's what the, the Bible says. The way to a relationship with God is just to say, to say I believe in my heart that Jesus is who he said he is, that he did do what the, the Bible claims that he did, that he died for me and he rose again. And I just then confess that with my mouth. I say, this is what I believe. I believe that Jesus did this for me. There's not a magical prayer to pray. There's no um, set words that, that you have to pray. But if you've never invited Jesus to come into your life, you've never asked God to forgive you of your sins, I just want to pray a prayer that would be... Uh, uh, just a model prayer. Um, you can use these words and just pray something like this in your own words, in your mind, in your heart, because God wants to hear directly from you. But you could pray something like this. God, I acknowledge my need for you. There's been something missing in my life. There's been a void there. I've tried to fill it with other things. I've tried to make excuses for feeling this uneasiness. But I recognize today that what's been missing all along is a relationship with you. And I'm grateful that Jesus made it possible for me to have this relationship with you, God. That Jesus came and took the penalty for all of my sins, everything that was keeping me separated from you. And he died on a cross to pay the penalty. So it didn't fall on me anymore, but it fell on Jesus. And so because of that, then, God, I can ask you to forgive me of my sins and put me in a right relationship with you to fill this void, this vacuum in my heart that's been longing for you. But then not only did Jesus die, but, God, you raised him back to life. And now that gives me this hope that this life isn't all that there is for me, 
there is an eternity to be spent with you. And so I thank you for making me your son or your daughter, for bringing me into your family, for wiping the slate clean, giving me a brand new beginning, but also placing inside of me the hope that I will spend eternity with you. Thank you, God, for doing that for me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross and being raised from the dead. And then, as the Bible said, thank you, Holy Spirit, for making that love known to me, for giving me that faith to believe that this is true. And I'm going to live from this day forward with Jesus as my Lord and as my Savior. And God, I pray for my friends, my fellow aliens and strangers. I pray that this week you would help them, first of all, to not be afraid. Secondly, that you would help them to always set apart in their heart Christ as Lord. Third, I pray that you would help them to be prepared to give an answer to everyone who would ask them for the reason, for the hope that they have. And fourth, I pray that you would help them to give those reasons gently, respectfully, and with a clear conscience before you, so that everything that we do as we share that hope with others brings glory to you, points people to you time and time again. Be with my friends this week. Make them great apologists. Help them to rely on the hope that is so rock solid in their heart. This hope is based on the fact that Jesus, you died. You rose again. Your word tells us all of these things and we know that it's true, but we know that our lives are different because you are in it. So let my friends walk that hope out this week, I pray, in the marvelous name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you, friends. I love you. Pray that you have a wonderful week. Grab some of those uh, application questions. You think through them. Get together with a friend. Talk through them as well this week. And uh, that will help you as well. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.